recording live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, national syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben. And I'm your co-host, Carissa. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So everyone, welcome into today's program. Uh, today on the show, even though it's, uh, yeah, I'm expecting a lot of you to be out there in line and doing uh, your civic duty. But hey, for everyone else out there, you could sit back, relax, and listen to a full hour of computer and technology news. And uh, everyone, so before we get started, ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything, past shows, future shows, articles, reviews, show notes, podcasts, and more. Check it all out, ComputerAmerica.com. And of course, find us on social media at ComputerAmerica on all of those. I think I think social media is probably the best way to get in touch with us if you would like to, you know, ask us to cover a topic, explain something. We also do PC troubleshooting whenever it comes up, as well as, you know, we take requests for guests to appear on the program and, yeah, and suggestions because, uh, you know, Carissa will attest to this as well. Sometimes the hardest part about scheduling a guest is even deciding who to send a message to. Like coming up with a list of people to invite on the show uh, is sometimes harder than uh, getting them to appear on the show so and sometimes we want to know what you guys want to listen to too so that too that's that too that too so with uh with that being said carissa how you doing Pretty okay. How are you? Not bad, not bad. And just getting everything set, uh, running a little bit behind schedule, but that's going to be okay. We are going to have a very good show, lots of different stories, and yeah, looking forward to it. So everyone, let's go ahead and uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start with computer and technology news, if you're ready. I am ready. All right, here we go. Okay, so I think that for our first story, we are going to do uh, this one. And uh, just, re- just real quick, Carissa, how has your experience with uh, Bethesda, and I should say specifically the Elder Scrolls series, been? Have you played Skyrim, uh, Oblivion? I mean, what is your history with the franchise? Well, I played Oblivion back when it was, what was it, on the PlayStation, uh, the Xbox 360. Mm-hmm. I played it oblivion on that and i i got maybe to level 40 in skyrim it wasn't really my my cup of tea i prefer the fallout franchise personally um but i i've i've dipped my toes into some of the the oblivion well, stuff right and if Elder you know Scrolls. about right and if you know about uh fallout then you know you're very familiar with the game type well this one is uh a little bit related to that because there has been an announcement from bethesda and their much anticipated elder elder scroll 6 uh They've been pretty uh, mum about what's going on over there. They have, uh, they've been working furiously for, I think what some people have said, like six years in development. Not as long as uh, Cyberpunk 2077, but... Which was uh, pushed back, wasn't it? Yes, that was also recently pushed back to, I think it has like an early December release date now, as opposed to uh, an early November release date. So another month, even, even though... And Carissa, that happened while we were uh, taking a break. But yeah, that, uh, they said, oh, it's gone gold. And what gold means in software development is that whatever is uh, whatever the, the software is, it's printed on disks and the master disk and it is ready to be shipped out. So going gold means that you're done. You're done with, I guess, the base software. But, you know, in, uh, anyone who's played video games in the past 10 years knows that even... Uh, even if like you buy it on release day at midnight and you know there's a midnight release like there's zero possible way to get it sooner there's always a massive update file that needs to be downloaded before you play it even on the first day so mm-hmm. going gold means usually you're done with the game or at least it's in a complete state and you're ready to ship uh 
but with the pushback, they said we need to work on it another month. And yeah, there's probably now going to be a massive content uh, update that has to happen with uh, Cyberpunk 2077. So... That's fun. Thank you for bringing up those horrible memories, Chris. Up, but <laughs> Bethesda in particular, they have been pretty mum about uh, Elder Scrolls uh, Six, and it's been in development for a long time now. But uh, the funny thing is, when you develop something over the course of like six years or something like that, eight years, like I think um, Skyrim. Let's see, uh, Chris, if you could find this out real quick, when did Skyrim? have game of the year because i know it did win game of the year and i think it was like 2013 or whatever i feel it was. like that's right 20, yeah but, uh hold on yeah but find that out say? yeah I'll find so out. yeah so with that being said when ever since they put out skyrim they haven't really released any major content updates to that so they've been developing their next game you know it's been greenlit and yeah it always sells a billion so with that being said six seven eight years later they're still developing their elder scroll six and they still say they're about two to three years out from that and yeah it's it's funny because uh, they started working when the popular consoles and computers were at the level of like xbox 360 and that was the very beginning of the game obviously we've had the playstation 4 the xbox one uh and that whole generation of consoles coming out and now we're heading fast into playstation 5 and xbox um and xbox series x so they were developing for hardware that was two generations past, and now we're heading into a new generation. All of this means is that now they're heading into a large overhaul of the engine that runs the game because it's already like six years old before it even, you know, before it even releases. So, Carissa, uh, wow. did, did you find that? Well, it looks like it did it once in 20, 2011. And then- 2011, okay. So Again, yeah, uh, gamers uh, runner up for 2017's old game of the year. Yeah, that's that, Skyrim has been a loved game for a long time. So yeah, we're heading on to almost a decade since they've been working on Elder Scrolls Six, and the hardware has leaps and bounds come, you know, kind of come forward. So with that being said, uh, according to the article here, this is the overhaul on our engine is probably the largest that we've ever had, maybe even larger than Morrowind to Oblivion, which was pretty massive. Moreover, more people are, are working on the creation engine than ever before. And he noted that the team size was increased by a factor of five. So even more people working on assets and physics and all that good stuff that happens, you know, uh, the heavy lifting that the game engine itself does. They said that certain fundamental aspects of Bethesda's technology uh, won't change. Mod support, for instance, isn't going anywhere. So, uh, yeah, Skyrim 6 should have uh, mod support right out of the gate. You can modify the game any way you see fit. If you need to throw in super massive ponies in the game and you know <laughs> dragons breathe lightning instead of fire and everyone jumps at 300 percent gravity or whatever uh yeah you know you can do whatever you want uh and i gotta say honestly one of my favorite uh skyrim mods was uh chris i don't know if you've ever seen it but uh, years ago but it was someone made thomas the tank engine uh, into a dragon so and with all the sound effects of the thomas the tank engine kids show i did see that yeah yeah and it would fly out of the sky and breathe fire on you uh, as, thomas, yeah. <laughs> as thomas the tank engine would want to do so yeah Absolutely. the the mod community is just they're, they're always one of the first ones to to uh you know really take hold of that game but anyways uh they said that from rendering to animation to pathing to procedural generation uh he doesn't want to say everything but it's a significant overhaul it's taken us longer than we would have liked but it's going to power uh what we're doing with starfield and elder scrolls 6 uh, he said that when people see the results, hopefully they'll be happy as we are with what's on screen also and how we can go about making our games. Uh, as far as as far as when we can expect to, to get a chance to play the games, it's safe to say that they're in for the long haul. He's saying that, uh, and again, this is the creative director behind Elder Scrolls 6, and he, even he's saying we don't we can't answer when we'll be able to actually show you these games so he said that you might wonder uh he said that uh 
Let's see, you might wonder why Bethesda announced both titles so early if they don't plan to share any more information. That's something Howard touched on. He said Bethesda announced Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 at the same time that it did to reassure fans it was working on the type of experiences the studio is known for. Uh, 10 years in the making. Again, not quite... uh, not quite cyberpunk 2077 but uh chris it, it it's i do find it funny that you know they can start developing a game right in the middle of a generation of console and they you know i, I can't even say that they're wrapping it up but they are still going strong uh two generations later which is interesting because you have to take into account the different you know, the updates to the systems and all that stuff too. So you constantly yeah. have to be improvising and changing things within the, the development, which is cool. Yeah. And, and of course what they can expect people to run this on. I mean, you know, before you had to stick to limitations that were the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation four or whatever. Uh, but now they can expect, they can design a game that can be run on uh, much more powerful hardware. And I can imagine what that experience could be. I'm, I'm looking forward to, because you know if skyrim uh, i'm sorry if skyrim was as innovative as it was 10 years ago i can't imagine what they're able to do nowadays i mean i know we don't talk about video games a lot ever since you know gamer tuesday has been put on hiatus but video games are going to start getting very fun with procedural generation uh oh yeah you know we, we already have things like diablo where things are randomly put together and you know levels are automatically generated or if you play a- any kind of games that are kind of roguelike and you know uh things are automated and put together in you know so many different uh so many different uh, uh different combinations I mean, the more factors you add, the more combinations you get and the more like every time you play a game, it's going to be a new experience. And every time you play a game, it's going to be a unique experience to you. Yes, just like what No Man's Sky promised to be when it first released. So Hey, they've been updating that. I've been hearing good things about the updates. Yeah, the uh, from what I hear about the updates, they you know the game that they released was not the game that they promised. But over the past couple of years, you know, two three years, they have been working towards the game that they promised. So I will oh. give them credit on that. They have been updating. So here's hoping Elder Scrolls uh, actually releases a full game. Well, that'd be, that'd I, nice. I, I'm. <laughs> I'm sure that they will, but I do want to say that No Man's Sky, uh, if you if if anyone out there is super bored, and I mean like super bored, and you want to watch a documentary on a video game that you know kind of tanked, it was a very strange uh, series of events that led to No Man's Sky, and really what happened was that this indie uh, this indie developer that had maybe just a handful of game developers. Uh, They said, hey, you know, we can do this, this, and this. And then Sony said, we like your game. We're going to uh, give you some cash to finish working on your game and, you know, make it a little bit better than you thought you would. And we'll handle the the marketing. And so what would have been like a beta green light, you know, uh, a Steam green light kind of game that was, you know, maybe 20 bucks in in early alpha and whatever. uh, Suddenly Sony took the reins and just like a mad horse just took off at a running speed and said, this is going to be an amazing game. And they had to, you know, uh, No Man's Sky and the creative team behind it pretty much had to uh, fake uh, trailers so that, you know, Sony could deliver the promises that they were making. Like they were developing for the, uh, for the marketing team more than they were the game itself. So that's why you had like a twenty thirty dollar game being marketed as a sixty dollar game. And when it was finally released, people were like, "Man, this is not what Sony promised." And yeah, it never was. I, I mean, you know, uh, the game developers tried their best and tried to deliver on impossible deadlines and impossible promises, but. Again, there's great documentaries out there on this, and I highly encourage you to go see it from their perspective. But it it seemed like a development team that was passionate about their project, had the best of intentions, had the money, had the resources, but just didn't have the time. And it led to, uh, I I would say, a very... uh, a very point, uh, a very important point in video game history where, you know, hey, you can't believe all the hype. So... Right, especially yep. with the, the fake advertising and all that. And it's going to take so long. 
so right. long for the Steam reviews to come back from the negative. <laughs> well, it's luckily, take Steam, yeah. Well, well, luckily, Steam does have like overall reviews, which is one thing, and then recent reviews. So, uh, hopefully, the recent reviews are a little bit better. Uh, it's still going to take some time to really deliver the full game that they promised, but it, uh, yeah, it, it's well on its way. It's a completely different game for sure. So, anyways, uh, again, if you're just joining us, recap Bethesda is making major changes to their engine, and like they said. Said that includes everything from what's the exact quote here uh, from rendering to animation to pathing to procedural generation. So, what that means like rendering is the graphics, how it looks, and how it renders on the engine, uh, the animation, so how things move and how and how everything. Uh, well, yeah, just how everything looks, uh, to pathing. So your characters, uh, I know that like in Skyrim, you could, you know, if you got too close to the edge here, the character or the creature or monster would take the shortest quote unquote path and kind of run one way. And then you move across an invisible line and it would say, well, now he's over here. So we have to run the other way and you could bug out the pathing and, you know, you could do stupid stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. to procedural generation. So again, everything from, random creature types, random equipment, random stats on equipment, uh, stuff like that. It's all just going to get better and better and better. So here's to hoping Bethesda delivers on the hype that they're building. So yep. for sure. Uh, yeah. And there you go. So uh, best of luck to Melter Snowflakes. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and continue on to our next story. Chris, I see that you sent a number of stories, but I wanted to uh, touch on a couple of these here. Man, uh, after doing computer technology news yesterday, there's still a good amount of stories to do, so I'm very, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, there was another story I wanted to do here about, let's see, not that one, not that one. Uh, just to give you guys behind the scenes, we're going to be talking about BlizzCon in a little bit, as well as an AI camera that can't tell the difference between a person's head and a football. Hey, look, <laughs> a, uh, yeah, a website that has an autoplay video. Great. Um, you know what? Let's do this one. This one from The Hill. And again, yay, autoplay videos. Uh, the bane of my existence. Anyways, uh... I gotta say though, Chris, this is the first time that it's happened, and I'm sure that it won't show very well on the green screen, and I can't really show it because of, well, other obvious reasons, but yeah, uh, essentially, I got a phone call, and it's from, you know, kind of where my phone is registered down in Florida, and, but instead of having the number, it literally pops up as spam risk, like it it, it, you know, doesn't show any kind of number whatsoever because normally it would be five, six, one area code followed by the first three digits of my phone number, followed by random other digits. Uh, but yeah, Apple, I think with their latest iOS update are now labeling suspected spam calls as just straight up, uh, spam, you know, kind of, uh, this is spam. And well, that was, yeah, that was the first time I saw that. So hopefully spam calls will be a thing of the past in a couple of months. Hopefully, maybe. Yeah. Anywho, I bring this up because unidentified robocall told millions to stay home ahead of election. Oh and that my is a God. report. So obviously today... Uh, Don't yeah, stay we, home. Go out and vote. Exactly. We can tell you <laughs> very safely. Go out there and wear vote. Wear your mask. Do your thing. Yes, wear your mask. Be safe. All that good stuff. Uh, but yeah a uh, a robocaller told them so let's talk about this uh this was uh this was according to the washington post on tuesday that over the past several weeks about 10 million robocalls from fake numbers were made telling people to stay safe and stay home hmm so stay safe always a good message but then stay home not so good of a message on not election good. day the call features a female voice saying the message is a test call before telling people to stay inside uh, so they have a, uh, the CEO of the company Umail, which is a spam blocking company, said that, uh, told the newspaper that the calls did not directly mention the 2020 elections, but still aim to sow confusion and show vulnerabilities. Uh, yeah, in the phone system that could be exploited. And, you know, just like so many things out there. Carissa, actually, I'm going to deviate even this just to show you how uh, how pervasive it is. So obviously, spam calls, it's not hard to make uh, to set up one of these services. And again, 
pummel people with 10 million phone calls that hopefully get flagged, don't actually reach anyone, and hopefully people by now are so fed up that they don't actually answer spam calls. But if they do, I hope that they don't heed what they're saying. Anyways, the technology is very, very simple, and 10 million sounds like a lot. I can't imagine uh, it really affected that many people, if any. So, I do want to say, though, that these very obvious ways that people are, are exploring are exploiting technology, one of them I saw today because I was watching, uh, you know, I like to work and have uh, Twitch on in the background. And I was watching Twitch, checking out some of the most viewed uh, channels. There was a channel with like 53,000 viewers on or something. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think it was like 53,000. That's a lot. Which, yeah, which is a very, very, you know, impressive number. And the account hosting the channel or, you know, the, the one that had the channel was Elon Musk underscore it was like five, eight, six, two or something like that. You know, Elon Musk underscore a couple of numbers. And I was like, wow, Elon Musk can't even get his own name on Twitch. I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised on that. Now I tuned in. The title was something like, you know, and, and the channel was just created. Like there was no information on it. And, uh, you know, it was not an established channel. Red flag. And then the message was, you know, the title of the stream and, and all the messaging was like, Elon Musk believes in Bitcoin and blockchain so much that he's doing a giveaway. Send 0.1 Bitcoin to this address and they will immediately send you back 0.2 Bitcoin. And they had different thresholds for different amounts going all the way up to like 15 Bitcoin. Uh, I think I just saw a report the other day saying that Bitcoin just hit like $11,000. So, yeah, you know, if you are one of the few who could send 10 Bitcoin. Yeah. So each of those is $11,000, each Bitcoin. Let's see. Uh, Bitcoin price currently is sitting at 13780 So the report I saw actually said it hit 14000 for the first time. But it, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, kind of reduced. So, yeah, so if you send them $137,000, they would then turn around and send you, I think it was like 25 Bitcoin in return. So it was something like half a million dollars. Uh, and again, this is on Twitch, uh, one of the first ones. And the video that they had was like, it was all this stuff made up around it. And then in the middle, it was a YouTube video of Elon Musk and one of his scientists talking about Neuralink. Like it wasn't... Um, you know, as somebody just popped into the stream, I was like, oh, he's answering questions from the chat, uh, you know, talking about Neuralink. And I looked at all this. Finally, I was like, this is so fake. And I went to the Bitcoin address and I, or, or to the, you know, to the Bitcoin wallet address and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, this is so weird. Uh, Carissa, as I was watching it, like I was like maybe three minutes into it, Twitch, took it down and deleted the channel like oh. right there as I was watching it. And I was like, Oh good. They finally got it. But I don't know how many of those, you know, 50,000 viewers, because trust me, uh, yeah, 50,000 people were not tricked into watching that. Uh, but I'm sure that a couple of thousand, you know, maybe 53,000 minus 50,000 and the 3000 were legitimate viewers like myself who were watching it. Those are the people who were tricked. So you can use, you know, things like view bots, spam calls, DNS, uh, 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 DDoS, uh, you know, things like that. Very simple, but you can use them to great effect to influence and affect people. So, but I did find that to be a very funny thing that just happened to me today. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I, I, I wonder why like that's happening. I think I've been seeing that happening on Facebook too, but with things like uh, the ones I've been seeing are like Snoop Dogg giving away money. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of mm -hmm. weird, you know, or like other celebrities doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was the largest ever Twitter hack, if you recall that a, a, a little while ago. Mm -hmm. And essentially they got into the back door in Twitter and like their headquarters and they were able to send out tweets as like everyone and they sent tweets out as like Elon Musk, Snoop Dogg. They sent it out as Oprah. They sent it out as Obama. They were able to send it out to the largest communities on Twitter. And essentially all they said was, uh, send Bitcoin to this wallet right now. And 
luckily, like no one did it. So, but they did Yikes. reach an audience of like hundreds of millions of people with that fake message. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, stealing cryptocurrency seems to be, uh, getting worse and worse. And I mean, like I said before, we are seeing Bitcoin like over the past month alone, you know, on October 3rd, it was worth about $10,000. And right now it's sitting at just under $14,000. Uh, Bitcoin is getting back up to those crazy prices. Uh, you know, there was a, obviously it's not at 20,000 yet, but it's not far off considering how, you know, how far it was at one point. So. Right. And I mean, it's it's easier than, uh, you know, robbing a bank these days. So why not Bitcoin? Yeah. And much less traceable. So right now uh, to wrap up the story again from the Hill, uh, they said that uh, specifically Ratcliffe said that uh, Iran was behind the emails that were uh, spoofed to intimidate voters. We didn't talk about that on the show, Carissa, but uh, yeah, it was essentially uh, Iran was supposedly sending out spam. You know, speaking of uh, technology that can easily be adapted to influence people, spam email. They had them sending out there saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, director of national intelligence and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, they said that uh, they were sending out spam emails saying don't vote or else, you know, you're going to get killed and you're going to get shot by right right wing radical protesters and proud boys and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, all that was fake and it was perpetrated by Iran. So interesting. Yeah. Um, very simple, very simple to do methods but having good effect and and not good as in you know this is a good thing but good as in it's having some it's measurable effect yeah and and it's uh it's not hard to do so uh yeah i think we're about done with that but again uh don't listen to the robot lady go out and vote do your thing yep wear your mask for sure for sure so uh let's go ahead and do one of yours carissa uh Let's talk. Wait, what's this BBC one? Uh, unfortunately, BBC doesn't tend to. Uh, also good. I also saw that one, but I think we're going to go with RoboDog. So excellent, good choice. Another real-world example of Boston dynamics, and it's Robot Dog. Is by the way, is is Chernobyl still uh, uh, radioactive? I guess this is what it's they're finding. Could it be radioactive for a long time? A very yeah. long time. Yeah, it happened, you know, decades ago, but I guess it's still uh, still doing its thing. So, okay. Uh, Spot Boston Dynamics' famous robot dog has a new job surveying the Chernobyl nuclear disaster to measure radiation levels. So what Spot's going to find out. Exactly. 34 years after Chernobyl. They said that... Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's still mostly a ghost town, with the exception of scientists, stray dogs, and some tourists with a morbid fascination. That's due to the high levels of radiation in and near the reactor plant in Ukraine. Now, obviously, Boston Dynamic and Spot, uh, they are on a mission to measure the radiation level so scientists can create a comprehensive 3D map to illustrate the distribution of the harmful electromagnetic waves. Uh, they say on October 22nd, researchers at the University of Bristol first deployed the quadruped robot, uh, according to Ukrinform, a state-owned yep. information source. There we go. Uh, yeah, they uh, they mentioned that uh, characterized Spot's new role as a way to study robotic systems in extreme environments. I would say high levels of radiation would be a very uh, a very hostile environment to electronics. Uh, so obviously spot can be seen tracking around the former site of the unit four reactor, which ruptured after a failed safety test in April, 1986 meant to sim, uh, meant to simulate an electrical power outage in the video. You can see the robot dog examining various sites and in and around the new safe confinement structure, a sarcophagus meant to contain the radioactive material inside. So, yeah, I did not know that, that they just uh, built this giant uh, cement block uh, sarcophagus around the reactor instead of actually dealing with it. Uh, I didn't know that either. It's the most cost-effective way, I suppose, to do this. Yep. 
Oh, he's got little that, booties on too. That's adorable. Yeah, uh, they said that after these tests, which covered the four. Oh, and actually, I'm not even showing the video. Let's change that up. There we go. So yeah, uh, after those tests, which covered the four miles of forest surrounding the nuclear power plant, the team identified new radioactive hotspots that were previously unknown to local officials. Presumably, Spot's job is to find more of these dangerous locations, which I guess is you know. Uh, one really good reason to use Spot because yeah, you can have someone with a Geiger counter walking around and you know kind of testing these things, but these random uh, areas of high electromagnetic radiation and high levels of nuclear radiation, uh, they are still random. Like they said, they found new ones even today. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to randomly put someone and say, you know, my legs are itching really bad. Uh, no, you want uh, the robot to go in and hopefully, you know, not suffer any kind of harm either. So it's not clear how long Spot will be investigating the grounds in and around Chernobyl, but if the robot dog's many and varied jobs to date serve as any kind of indicator, this certainly won't be the last dance with the nuclear energy industry. Uh, yeah, and I think that Spot is still... Uh, still on sale. I think they're selling it for like $40,000 or, or something like that. Or like oh, that's 70, it. 000. Yeah, it's like seventy or $40,000 or one of those. It, it's really like the price of like a, you know, a high-end car, which for, you know, kind of robotics and medical research. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people would expect to pay a lot more for that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the functionality and how, you know, how well balanced this guy is and all the stuff he can do. Yeah. He's, I thought uh, it would be at least 100 yeah, and he's uh, he's very very effective. And by the way, just got a comment here saying that uh, there there's a documentary on Chernobyl. They mentioned that they built giant robotic arms inside the sarcophagus so that they could dismantle the plants from afar. So uh, you know, kind of looking at it, I guess that's what all the scaffolding is there around the plant. Uh, instead of having workers dismantle the plant, looks like they're building uh, robots to do it. So uh, yeah. Nuclear or irradiated robots. Uh, again, speaking of fallout, I think, uh, Carissa, you know the answer <laughs> to all of this. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, this next one, hot, bu hot button issue. Uh, talk about it on the show before, and I'm so on board with what California is going to be voting here. Uh, it's going to have major repercussions for certain industries like grocery delivery and ride sharing and the quote unquote gig economy. Uh, I'm hoping for a positive resolution. So, uh, yeah, this according to Reuters saying that California voters to decide the fate of the gig economy, uh, because Chris, uh, you, uh, the California economy, I don't know if you know this, uh, the U.S. economy is the number one in the world. Like, you know, uh, the entirety of the United States is the number one in the entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with China leading at number two, uh, with Germany being like number three or something like that. Uh, yeah. So I think you have like China or U.S., China, Germany, uh, followed by like the U.K. might be up there as well. Anyways, if you separated California into its own country, it would be the number fifth, or I guess the fifth largest economy in the entire world. Like it beats out like Saudi Arabia, it beats out entire chunks of the Western societies. Uh, California crazy. is a huge economy. So what California decides is really what the uh, is really what the economy in the U.S. does. Because if you lose the ability to operate in California, you're not going to be competitive in mm -hmm. this economy. I mean, that makes sense with that, that size. Right. So I bring this up because uh, California, they get to decide the fate of the gig economy workers, trend-setting California votes on the future of the gig economy on Tuesday, which is today. Uh, they say that deciding whether to back a ballot proposed by Uber and its allies that would cement app-based food delivery and ride-handling driver status as an independent contractor, not as employees. Uh, now, obviously, California has been pushing back on this one because they feel like if you are, you know, if you want to earn a livable wage on, let's say, Uber, you have to drive 40 to 50 to 60 hours a week. 
for the company to earn enough money to, you know, make your bills. Now, the problem with that, though, is that you are working 60 hours for a company, and in some cases exclusively for that company, and you are not a, you know, you're not a full-fledged employee. You are a, uh, you're a gig worker, you are an independent contractor, but the thing about it is, is that independent contractors contract with different companies. But, you know, if you are only working for one company, technically that would make you an employee because right. hey, you're not working for others. Uh, and there's been some pushback one way or the other. And I think what has really uh, come to light is that if these are shot down and Uber and Lyft and Uber Eats and all the other different technology companies, if they have to start classifying every one of their drivers as a full-fledged employee, they cannot afford to do what they do. And I would say that the biggest problem with that is that if they can't afford to exist by fairly compensating their employees, they probably shouldn't have the right to exist because that is saying we only exist to exploit. We only right. exist because of exploiting people and lots of them at that. So, yeah, they get to decide this. They said that the measure known as Proposition 22 marks the culmination of years of legal and legislative wrangling over a business model that has introduced millions of people to the convenience of ordering food or a ride or a ride with the push of a button. Companies describe the contest as a matter of ensuring flexibility for new generation of workers who want to choose when and how they work. Opponents see an effort to exploit workers and avoid employee-related costs that could amount to more than $400 million uh, each for Uber, Lyft, and other companies. Now, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, Postmates, some of whom threaten to shut down California if they lose, have poured more than $205 million into what has become the most expensive ballot campaign in state history. Think about that. It would cost them, you know, each of them, admittedly, about $400 million uh, to classify them as employees, but they're willing to spend, you know, uh, an eighth of that, a tenth of that, they're willing to spend a tenth of that to make sure that that doesn't happen. Two hundred million dollars, almost a, you know, almost a quarter of a billion dollars to make sure that they are not classified as employees. They really hate them. And I mean, that's that's taking so much away from the people that are you know putting their their hearts and souls and vehicles on the line to do all this stuff to make these companies money. Like they're not getting health insurance. They're not getting benefits. They're not getting any safety measures from doing any of this. They're not getting, you know, they're not getting any kind of chance of, at a raise. They're not getting, you know, there's no union whatsoever. There's no chance to uh, get any kind of money back for the wear and tear on your car. And I think that in most or in some places, these drivers are actually working for less than minimum wage, uh, right. you know, due to this. So they don't get any of the protections that a that a uh, that an employee would receive. And of course, you're also talking things like sick days because hey, if you're too sick to work, guess what? They just don't pay you. That's just the end of it. Because right. It is. So they say they, and so let's go ahead and continue on. In a last minute attempt to sway voters, Uber on a Monday night email urged California customers to vote yes on the proposal, capping off months of intense campaigning, including billboards, frequent text messages, and in-app push notifications, saying that this debate is very emotional for me. Jan Kruger, 62, who drives part-time for Lyft, and saying that uh, I want to keep driving and I want it for, uh, and I want... Uh, I want to keep driving when I want and for whom I want, saying that. So, yeah, people are definitely uh, being swayed by this. Everybody is super concerned about the companies leaving or raising prices and not available in remote areas. The, uh, the proposition is the app maker's response to the new California law that requires companies that control how workers do their jobs to classify those workers as employees. And... 
yeah, I, I didn't realize that was a stipulation that they were controlling, but if you drive for Uber and Lyft, I assume, I've not done one of these apps, but they say that you have to have a car in this condition, you have to have a car uh, that's clean, it has to be this model year or newer, uh, you right. have to have you know this kind of thing, you, you got to be here, you got to do this. They set up very specific rules that you have to operate by if you're going to drive for one of these app services. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I guess what they're saying there is that if if they're imposing those kinds of limitations on how you perform your job, then they're your employer. They're 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 not uh, you know just some independent contractor that you get to do any way you want. No, they're your actual right. employers. Yeah, so. if they if they have a say in any of that, then yeah, they should be taking more responsibility. Right. So they say that companies warned that they could cut eighty percent of drivers, double prices, and even leave California if they're forced to pay benefits, including minimum wage, unemployment insurance, health care, and workers' compensation. So, uh, yeah, and they even have a handy little chart down here that would show how much prices would increase in certain parts of California. Um, Did they do background checks and stuff like that? They were supposed to. They do currently. But, uh, yeah, the, I think that they do. I think that they do. Yes. Okay. Yeah, like if they're looking at that, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're they're definitely acting like employers, but then they're not actually doing any of the benefits. Like they're doing all of the everything that they can to protect themselves, but nothing to protect their workers. So, mm -hmm. uh, and again, fear tactics like this one here, uh, such as will you know you will never be able to use our service again. You will have to pay two or three times as much. You will uh, have longer wait times. Uh, all these things are just saying, look how bad it's going to get, as opposed to anything else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so let's go ahead and continue on here. California represents about 10%, or about $2 billion, of Uber's global rides and food delivery gross bookings, and 16% of Lyft's total, total rides. So if they pulled out of California, again, you're looking at a 10% to a 20% cut for these companies right off the bat. Uh, Company-sponsored surveys have found more than 70% of current gig workers do not want to be employees, but labor groups have questioned those pollings, saying that the drivers are divided. And you could imagine that something like, uh, you know, maybe an in-app thing would be like, uh, polling in general is actually a really bad way to get information because depending on the way you word it, uh, one of my favorite examples that I always do this, uh, you know, whenever I talk about polling, Okay, Carissa, answer this one. Uh, do you believe in giving money away to uh, illegal immigrants? Yes. Okay, well, no. Uh, most people say no to that. And, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, so, uh, but most people say no to that. You know, do you believe in giving money away to illegal immigrants? They say no. But then you turn around and say, do you believe that every child in this country, regardless of their background, deserves a fair education? Yes. Yeah, and most people say yes to that one. Those are including illegal immigrants' children. Yes, children. And, and it, again, regardless of the background, they deserve an education. Those are the same things. Paying for education for every child in America is giving money away to illegal immigrants in a roundabout way. It's just the way that you word these two questions. You can get someone to disagree with themselves in you know mm -hmm. very very evenly, except Carissa. She's very <laughs> she's very to the point on both of those. But to most people, uh, yeah, there you go. So polling to me has always been you know it's like who's asking the poll, uh, who's asking the question, how are the questions worded? Yeah, you can come up with any kind of skewed figure that you want. So. Um, yeah, I think that's about the end of it. Um, we will find out after California votes yeah. how this will go, because uh, again, if they strike down this proposition, then these companies have to stop, uh, exploiting everyday, uh, workers, especially in, in this day and age where let's face it, a lot of people in the, uh, in the service industry or, you know, a lot of other industries that are shut down due to COVID, they have turned to food delivery, grocery delivery, and ride sharing apps to, you know, make a little bit of money while they are out of work or looking for other work. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, uh, we will see. We will see. Okay. Yeah, I hope it so, goes in the workers' favor. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, there's that one. I want to, Carissa, real quick, uh, Ant Group. Have you heard about these guys? 
No. I don't blame you because they just had their IPO today. Oh. And it got shut down. And I'm very curious as to why the Ant Group was shut down. So Ant Group, and it was started by the one, the only, uh, Mr. Jack Ma. Do you know who Jack Ma is, Carissa? I have no idea who that is. Impressive. Jack Ma is, I think, by most accounts, one of the richest people in the world. Uh, oh. Let me get let me get this. Uh, he is the founder of Alibaba and owns like 80% oh. of the company. Oh, uh, Jack Ma, and let me see this uh, here. So... Uh, let's see. So Ma is global ambassador for the Chinese business and is often listed as one of the most powerful people in the world. Uh, let's see. His worth is about $48 billion and is the second wealthiest person in China and is one of the wealthiest people in the world. And he's, I think, 20th. But yeah, he started the Alibaba group and he owns a large portion of that. And again, you know, uh, I think Jack Ma, when it comes to Chinese business dealings, the two go hand in hand. He's just, uh, yeah, he's uh, pretty uh, pretty influential in that sphere. And by the way, just because I'm browsing his Wikipedia article real quick, fun fact about Jack Ma, in 2017, Ma made his acting debut with his first kung fu short film, Gong Shu Dao. It was filmed <laughs> in collaboration with Double Eleven Shopping Carnival Singles Day. In the same year, he also participated in a singing festival and performed dances during the Alibaba's 18th anniversary party. So, uh, what a diverse guy! I should say billionaire and uh, you know, kind of businessman slash actor. I guess so. Uh, he's a kung fu, kung fu actor. Fun fact. Neat. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, Jack Ma. Anyways, he started this thing called Ant Group, and because he is so influential in, bi in business spheres, uh, he started this, and they were going to have an IPO saying that they were uh, you know, going to do all these amazing things, and he was going to bring in all of his expertise and start this new global shift, and it was going to be one of the largest IPOs in history, and it was put on hold. I'm, I'm honestly not sure what happened, but it was supposed to raise, I think, about like 80% or uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, not eighty percent. It was supposed to raise something like eighty billion dollars for Taiwan and China with their IPO, but then it was uh, put on hold. It was suspended for some reason, and we'll find out. So Ant Group's world record-setting initial public offering in Shanghai and Hong Kong has been suspended. The Shanghai and Hong Kong stock exchanges made the announcement on Tuesday, and Alibaba, well, yeah, they own about a 33% stake in the Ant Group, saw its shares fall about 5%. Uh, they said that uh, Ant Group's controller Jack Ma, executive chairman, uh, and the CEO of the company were summoned and interviewed by regulators in China, according to a statement. Uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, China just called them up and say, hey, you guys got to get in here. There's something fishy here. Uh, on Tuesday, the Shanghai Stock Exchange referred to the meeting and explained why it was uh, referred to that meeting and explaining why it was suspended, saying that they reported significant issues such as the changes in financial technology regulatory environment. These issues may result in your company not meeting the conditions for listing or meeting the information disclosure requirements. As a result, the exchange decided to suspend the company's listing on the Science and Technology Innovation Board. And, uh, yeah. Shortly after, the Ant Group said the listing of the Hong Kong shares will also be suspended. And they were gearing up to raise just under $34.5 billion it would have in what would have been the, initial, the largest initial public listing ever. Uh... Yeah, they have a statement here. Ant Group sincerely apologizes to you for any inconvenience caused by this development. We will properly handle the follow-up matters in accordance with the app in in accordance with the applicable regulations of the two stock exchanges, we will overcome the challenges and live up to the trust uh, on the principles of stable innovation, embrace of regulation, service to the real economy, and win-win cooperation. So, yeah, looks like China had an issue. So. Hmm. Um, looks like they, it might have to do with issues with micro lending between banks and individuals. And I think the Ant Group was going to get into that where they were going to loan individuals small amounts of money directly and like, you know, kind of cut out regulators in the banks. Uh, oh, yeah, I can see how yeah. that would upset some people there. Yeah. So, uh, what's going to happen? Who knows? But so far... 
yeah, $34.5 billion in IPO. Just suspended just like that. So All right. pretty different, pretty different. Okay. Uh, there's that one. Let's go ahead and continue on here. Uh, Carissa, at your Walmarts, have been assuming that you went to Walmart, uh, have you seen any robots in Walmart? Once, and it was terrifying. <laughs> what was it doing? <laughs> Huh? Was it just ripping people to shreds? What what was this terrifying robot doing? That's what I was imagining it was doing, but I think it was just sweeping, but I felt like it was following me and I didn't like it. Oh, okay. So we have an oversized Roomba. Now, yeah. uh, this one also from CNBC, and they said that Walmart ends contract with robotics company and opts for human workers instead, report says. So this just came out uh, yesterday, and yeah, Walmart is... Uh, they're going to keep using humans. So there's a I win. I guess that's good. So like, let's say California doesn't pass that thing. All of those. To be fair, Walmart you know. actually hires their employees. They don't have independent contractors. So. Yeah. Right. Walmart actually has employees. So that's yeah. A good but the thing. people that can't, you know, get the proper jobs, they can at least go to Walmart and get a job or something maybe. Right. And, and, uh, and, and there's a whole thing with part-time versus full-time employment and Walmart mm-hmm. and hours and blah, blah, blah. But we're not getting into that. We're talking about this, saying that at some Walmart stores, robots have roamed the sales floor and helped check, uh, and helped check its shelves if they were stocked. But the big box retailer has now decided to end the contract with the robotics company behind those machines. So about 500 robots were in Walmart stores. Uh, I'm sorry, 500 robots were in Walmart's more than 4,700 stores when the contract ended. So I think they had 500 robots in 500 stores across the country and they were doing uh, tests to see, you know, if these robots actually save them money and it looks like for now uh people are still cheaper so uh, well, i guess that's good are they gonna like repossess the robots or i, well, I guess it's just a contract right so. uh, yeah it's just a contract so they send them back and they you know and the robotics company has to figure out what to do with these 500 robots but walmart mm-hmm. has seen significant growth during the coronavirus pandemic and the company's online sales nearly doubled in the second quarter that's created a new challenge for the box big box retailer quickly restocking shelves and making sure that it has the right inventory on hand And they mentioned that uh, the CEO of Walmart said that sporadic out of stocks have continued to be a problem. He said that if he could change one thing about Walmart's business, it would be to have an even higher in stock level. So, uh, yeah, the CEO of Walmart just said if we could change one thing, it would be having even more of everything. So, so bigger Walmarts, super ultra mega Walmarts. <laughs> yes, that there you go. You've just done their marketing <laughs> for them. Uh, according to the journalist report, Walmart has come up with a simple and cost-effective way to manage the products on its shelf with the help of its workers rather than using the robots. Uh, they said that the report said Walmart U.S. chief also worried about shoppers' reactions to the robots. So much like you said, Carissa, it was terrifying. Uh, that seems to be another key factor in why they decided not to go ahead with it. Uh, mm. Just a little bit too dystopian, I guess. Even although I, no offense if you work at Walmart, but uh, I was about to say, even if you see a smiling uh, employee's face, not many of them smile. Uh, they're 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 doing their job. They're very busy. I don't think Walmart pays them to smile, and you know they're, they're very <laughs> busy doing the tasks that they have to do. So, which is funny because wasn't the Walmart thing like the, the logo for a long time like a smiley face? Yeah, a smiley Maybe that face was Kmart. And the rollbacks and uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that was Walmart. Was, I think yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anywho, Walmart <laughs> is pressing ahead with other tech experiments, including uh, they said that they would turn four stores into e-commerce laboratories with test digital tools and different strategies that could speed up restocking shelves and fulfilling online orders. Uh, Maybe if COVID hadn't have happened, maybe Walmart would have still been testing and maybe even eventually utilized their robots. But because of COVID and the increased amount of stocking and product shipping that they have to do, as of this moment, humans are just going to do that better than robots. Mm -hmm. Um, You know? I, it, it's, Plus, it's it, the human element too, because you know everyone's in their house and stuff. And the one time you go out to Walmart, maybe you want to see somebody there rather than a robot. 
Yeah, and and maybe just you know dealing with the expansion and the differences just didn't uh, didn't make sense. I don't think this will be the end of robots in grocery stores and stocking and you know this kind of service. I think just at the moment, Walmart is canceling this version of it. I still expect to see a lot more automation, a lot more self-service, you know, kind of self-checkout lines and uh, checkout that is, you know, strictly based on camera instead of on people. Um, yeah, I, I fully expect people to still be uh, have their jobs displaced by technology. But this particular aspect of it seems to be, you know, not it. So, Right. So there you go. Well, that's uh, neat. Yep, for sure, for sure. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about... Okay, just real quick. Uh, quick announcement. Blizzard. Uh, BlizzCon will not be a thing this year. Or at least not oh. in the way that we're used to. Uh, I actually love BlizzCon. I, I, I think it's a lot of fun. But uh, anyways... Like most other events over the last eight months or so, BlizzCon did not go ahead as usual. Tens of thousands of fans would have attended. Instead, they have BlizzCon Line. Yes, BlizzCon Line. Nice, nice uh, advertising there. That's a good. S- someone, a good uh, someone had a good day when they came up with that one. So instead yeah. of BlizzCon Online, it's BlizzCon Line. So love it. Um, Brilliant. Yep. So unlike BlizzCon proper, you will be able to stream the whole event for free. I guess because they were having, uh, you know, no in-person event and you know whatever digital goodies. Um, yeah. Instead of paying fifty bucks because that's what it was last year for the virtual ticket, um, it's just going to be for free. Anyone can tune in. Anyone can watch. And of course, some of the esports events as well. So I'm sure, you can donate and stuff too if you want to like you know, do something like that if they're looking to make money. Yeah. I, I I really think that, you know, putting on this big event, which is itself just a giant advertisement, I think that'll be, you know, kind of where the big money is, Uh, which is good. You know, I don't know many people who would pay for these things when they, you know, like myself, I just waited until after the whole event and I looked up highlights and just, you know, didn't have to sit through, uh, you know, hours upon hours of content and I could just get the main thrust of it. So, right. With that being said, at BlizzCon, only certain aspects are free to watch, as we mentioned before. But now, instead of 50 bucks, everything is free. It's uh, We want a big virtual celebration, so BlizzCon Line will be free to watch and engage in. They said that the video is mostly a cast. Uh, I'm sorry. The video is mostly a catch up on what's been happening at Blizzard in the recent months. Uh, they mentioned that 95% of employees are currently working from home amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and that some uh, uh, some of the upcoming uh, World of Warcraft expansion, Shadowlands, uh, BlizzCon line will lose the spectacle of an in-person event, but hopefully they'll be able to create and cater to this uh, to this online only kind of uh, event so they can optimize for what it is they're going to present from the other conventions and other keynotes that we've seen over the past couple of months uh, such as apple such as e3 such as uh, you know so many other uh, events they're different Um, they may not be as good but for the times that we're living in Boy, they do the job and they get your information out there and they're much, much, much more affordable and safer to put on. So, Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing to consider, too, is this one in particular, it's for Blizzard, which is World of Warcraft, which you're going to be sitting at your computer to play anyway. So, like, it's okay that this one's kind of, you know, not in person. Right. Although, I I mean, going to BlizzCon is a whole thing in itself. Oh, yeah. And I I hope to get there maybe next year. But, uh, yeah. We'll certainly find out. Anywho, uh, there will be news about Blizzard's current and upcoming games, and including Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4. Uh, you'll be able to find out exactly what's happening on February 19th and 20th. So normally BlizzCon is, you know, right about now, actually, or early November, late October. But uh, yeah, they pushed it back to late February. So All right. there you go. Uh, yeah, so that quick announcement and looking at the clock here, we have like 30 minutes left. So some of the other stories we didn't get to include, uh, yeah, you found one about battery free ocean exploration with MIT and how they're able to use sound. But, uh, yeah, I think these things just kind of float on the tide and float on the water and, you know, they're able to map without batteries. So I guess the, uh, the gyration of the ocean powers them. So 
it's pretty cool. Neat. Uh, there's that one. There was, uh, let's see, not that one. Let's see, Tesla Motors. Yeah, whatever. Uh, there was this one here from The Verge about an AI camera operator. So the camera was operated by an AI and it accidentally continuously picked up on one of the sideline referees because they had a bald head. And in that lighting, it <laughs> made his bald head look like the soccer ball because I guess the AI camera was trained to keep itself centered on the soccer ball. And <laughs> well, it again, does kind of look like a sock ball. It's very round, very, very white, sticks out against the grass. Yep, 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 yep. So unfortunately it did that. So there was that one. Uh, oh, the other one that we didn't get to, Voyager 2 actually made contact. That's right. That thing is, uh, let's see Ooh. if I can get a number here. It is 11.6 billion miles away, but it was able to receive a transmission and do its task just the same. So that thing is Amazing. currently very far away from earth everyone that's about it so we want to thank you so much tune in tomorrow for more computer america until next time have a great day thank you so much bye everyone see ya